So this talk, we're going to be looking at some of the subtle behaviours of digital signatures, and we're going to see how they've got some behaviours that you might not expect from their security definition. We're going to then move on to automated protocol analysis and look at how we can model those behaviours in tools that can automatically analyse protocols. So that's protocols rather than primitives. And finally, we're going to look at how to use that new improved tooling to examine real-world protocols, protocols that have been deployed, that are running on code somewhere, and that actually have attacks that from these subtle behaviours. So, digital signatures, probably the most boring cryptographic primitive. Sorry, guys. But that is, that is to their credit. They should be hard to misuse. Okay, they're, 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 that makes them very palatable to protocol designers because they're, they don't have a complicated API. Uh, you can generate a signature, you, sorry, you can generate a public key and a secret key, you can generate a signature, you can verify a signature. That's really pretty much all you're allowed to do by the standard definition. And the important thing here is just that if you, one, one important definition is that if it must be correct. That is, if you generate a public key and a signature in the right way and you verify it, you get back true. The only other important definition, the, the standard definition, is for existential unforgeability. So this is a little bit more involved, but here it's just a referee, uh, an, an honest party is going to generate a key pair and give that public key to the adversary. The adversary is allowed to ask for signatures on, a message, on messages of the adversary's choice. And finally, the adversary is going to win the security game if they can produce a message and a signature pair, which verify against that honestly selected public key, but the adversary never saw, previously saw a signature on that message. So this definition, it's older than me, it goes back to 1988. It is the standard definition that any modern signature scheme must satisfy. But there's some subtle behavior, as, I, as the title of the talk implies. So this property goes back to 1999. And here, an honest party is going to generate a signature on some message for their public key. And a malicious party is going to calculate a different public key such that the honest signature verifies under the malicious public key. So we have one signature for one message, which is verifying under two different public keys. One public key, which was honestly generated, and one public key, which the attacker controlled. And the attacker knows the, se the corresponding secret key to this public key. A slightly stronger property discovered a year later is that given a signature, a public key and a message, for an arbitrary choice of a different message, the attacker can also calculate such a public key. So here we have one signature produced by an honest party, and the attacker is going to pick an arbitrary different message and, say that, and claim that that signature is actually valid for their public key instead. So we have one signature that is valid for two different messages and public keys. So let's see how this can, be, this can go wrong at a higher level and when you have a protocol using this signature scheme. So at the beginning, we're going to have an initiator, I, and a responder, R, and they're going to start with some shared secret, K. So maybe this is in some Internet of Things or Bluetooth protocol, but they're going to start out with a shared secret, and they want to finish by learning each other's public key. So this is like a bootstrapping protocol. So the initiator is going to take a message, and they're going to sign it, with their, with their secret key. And then they're going to take that signature and they're going to do a Mac over it using their shared secret. And then they're going to send over their message, their public key, their signature, and the output of that Mac, the tag, over to the responder. The responder has the shared secret, so they can immediately check that this signature hasn't been tampered with. The signature is still the same bytes that were output by the initiator. And, they can, so, and hence, somebody that knew the, the original shared secret produced that tag. And then the responder can check that the signature is valid for the underlying message. And now the responder claims, well, the person that knew that shared secret K has sent me this message. And I know that because I checked the signature and I checked the tag. Now, we're going to attack that protocol using one of those, prop, those subtle properties that I just mentioned. So it begins in much the same way. The initiator is going to send out their message. And now the attacker is going to do a message key substitution. So they're going to pick a different message of the attacker's choice, and they're going to produce a new public key such that that signature will verify for the attacker's message and the attacker's public key. And now all they have to do is replace the message and replace the public key, and they can forward on the same signature and the same tag. When the responder comes to check the Mac, well, this is valid because nothing has changed about the tag, nothing has changed about the signature. 
and when the responder comes to verify that signature even though it was originally intended for a different message it's going to verify under the attacker's message and the attacker's public key so here the responder has now been confused about the identity of the initiator and they've accepted a message that wasn't sent by the original person that they shared their secret key with there are some further behaviors so 2002 now and we have signatures that collide so here we have we're going to have the attacker there's going to be no honest party involved now but an attacker is going to create one a secret key a public key and a signature such that it's valid for two different messages and a slightly stronger property that they're going to calculate a, se a secret key a public key and a signature which is going to be valid for essentially an arbitrary message with a with a non-negligible probability so in some in some signature schemes you can actually pick your public key and signature such that it will be valid for absolutely any message and this means that the signature doesn't identify any unique message it will validate for any any message that you put into it and this is and again this has been known since 2002 but this this an honest person would never produce such a signature but a malicious party might so a slightly different toy protocol now we're going to consider the reverse of the first toy protocol the initiator is going to start out knowing the responder's public key and at the end we want them to share some secret key and the responder also knows the initiator's public key so the initiator is going to create a ciphertext with asymmetric encryption so they're going to take the responder's public key and they're going to encrypt some arbitrary trojan fresh secret key for them and then perhaps bizarrely they're going to sign that shared secret key and you might think that this is a, a weird thing to do signatures don't have to protect their underlying message contents but in the real world people seem to do this all the time so we're going to use it in our toy protocol and now the initiator only has to send out their public key the ciphertext and the signature the responder can decrypt that ciphertext with their secret key and they're going to learn the underlying the, the, the proposed shared secret and now they can feed that into the verification algorithm and check that oh yep the initiator signed that key k so how is an attacker going to attack this protocol it's going to begin in just the same way and now the attacker is going to produce one of these colliding signatures such that it collides for any message such that it will verify for any message and simply strip off the honest signature and now the receiver will decrypt the same ciphertext and learn the same shared secret k and when they come to verify this against the attacker's signature it's going to verify so this is called an unknown key share attack because although the attacker has confused the responder about the identity of the person they're talking to, the attacker still doesn't know the shared secret K. So it's not perhaps catastrophic, but in practice, in high-level applications, this can, this can cause a number of other consequences. So we have these four behaviors. We have key substitution, message key substitution, colliding signatures, and a stronger form of colliding signatures. And in the paper, we talk about these properties in more detail, and there's a whole family of further notions to do with key substitution. But these are the four properties that we're going to look at today. So I think the first question to ask yourself when you're sort of faced with these, this kind of property is to go, well, how is it allowed? How does my security definition for signatures permit this to happen? Because the security definition is really meant to protect us. So when it comes to the verification of some signature for some message for some public key, there's only two possibilities. The public key was either produced from that key generation algorithm that the signature scheme prescribes, or it was produced in some other fashion. It was produced in some malicious way. Now, if it was produced by the, from the key generation algorithm, then there's only two further possibilities. Either the signature was produced with knowledge of the secret key, or some valid signature, or it was produced without that knowledge. So if, it, if that knowledge was used, then we might get back true from verification it, because of the correctness definition. But if the signature was produced without knowledge of the secret key or some corresponding signature, then our forgeability definition says that this is going to be, this is going to be false. Otherwise, it would be a forgery on the underlying signature scheme. But we have this third possibility. What if the public key was never produced from the correct key generation algorithm? What happens then? It's not defined. There is no security definition that applies in this case. There's no requirement about this, what the signature scheme must do or must not do. It's completely valid to define a secure signature scheme that in this case just returns a random coin. That doesn't affect any of the underlying security definitions. So what that means is that as a protocol designer, as somebody looking to use a signature scheme, if you're on the left-hand side of this tree, or my left, yeah, your left, 
then it's going to be, you've got these strong cryptographic guarantees that protect you from, from an attacker. And if you end up on the right hand side, it's pretty much uncertain doom. You don't know, you have no protection. You can't do a computational proof at this stage. You have no protection from the security, security definitions. So that's how these subtle behaviors relate to the security definition. And it's quite natural to also ask, like, well, are they practical? Just because the security definition doesn't require, doesn't, doesn't specify anything, what do actual real-world signature schemes do at this point? And it turns out that for real practical signature schemes, these behaviors are actually quite easy to exploit. So for RSA, for the classic RSA schemes, even for the ED25519, these behaviors exist. So if there's a red dot here, this means that there is a research paper showing you how to practically calculate a public key or a signature to use this behavior. Um, you, you, you know, you could run on your, your laptop, it doesn't require a supercomputer, it doesn't require any unusual setup assumptions. Uh, if it's green, that means that that behavior is absent in that particular scheme. But you can see that for the stuff that we actually deploy on the internet, that we use in the real world, it's pot that we, we're using signature schemes that have these behaviors. So at this point, we move on. We found some subtle behaviors. We have a suspicion that protocol designers aren't going to know about these behaviors because they're a bit esoteric. You know, they go back to old attack papers from the early 2000s. So now we're going to set out to have an automated method of discovering attacks on protocols that use these subtle behaviors. So in automated protocol analysis, we look at developing tools that will allow us to automatically analyze a protocol. So, and that means that we want to use the tool as a black box and we just want to feed into it some description of a protocol and some description of the properties that we want it to have. And that tool is going to give back to us either a concrete attack that will violate one of those security properties or it's going to give us a proof within the tools model that no attack is possible. Now, formally this problem is undecidable. So you might also just get no verdict. You get out of memory, you get out of RAM, you run out of time or so on. But in practice, this tends to work pretty well. Two of the most common tools you might have heard of are Tamarin and Proverif. And they've been used to analyze everything from like TLS 1.3 to signal to noise to 5G. And they've been used to both find proofs and to find new attacks that have been missed even by computational analyses. But the important point for us is that these tools have not changed their signature model since 2001. So they use an approximation. This approximation goes back to the the very first Proverif paper, and Tamarin and all the other tools have inherited it from this paper without reconsidering it. And 2001, as you might remember, is about when a lot of these behaviors were being discovered. So what we did was we took the, uh, these tools and we've improved them such that they can exploit these behaviors, such that they understand these behaviors. And that's given us an attack finding model. So this is a model for these tools where they can exploit these behaviors and it's it gives you a very concrete idea of exactly which algorithm the attacker must have used in order to derive this capability. But it's a bit unsatisfying because it relies on us prescribing, well, these are the possible algorithms that the, the attacker could use. So if it comes back and doesn't find an attack, it's not a very strong guarantee. How do we know that there isn't some additional behavior that's, very, that's possible that we just haven't thought of yet? So this brings us to a verification model. And this is quite different, for those of you that work in the symbolic model, this is quite different from the traditional approach. Instead of being an equation-based approach, this is involving Tamarin's constraint system. And it captures the statement of the form, the attacker can do anything with involving verification except. Anything except violate one of the, the security definitions. So this is much stronger. But of course, it has a disadvantage that if it does find an attack rather than a proof, you can't immediately recover whether the attack is practical because it might rely on some behavior that you don't actually know how to use or exploit in practice. So we have some subtle behaviors. We have a tool that can now, we can now use to automatically find attacks on protocols that exploit those subtle behaviors. We then went looking for protocols that have been deployed that are using signatures in ways that we would consider suspect and then start feeding them into Tamarin to see what might go wrong. So the first one I'm going to talk about today is WS security. This is an old standard from 2006. It's for securing SOAP messages. So this is back before TLS. This is in a time where Facebook, you can't access Facebook over TLS at this point. It's a scary time. Um, but people are sending each other XML blobs 
and they want to secure them. So they have a sig this is a, a standard for defining how to sign those blobs and encrypt them as a sort of pseudo TLS. It got a lot of attention from the academic community, a lot of tooling around how to verify these implementations and design them, some cryptographic analysis. Um, and by and large, it, it held up at the time. There were some attacks on it, but they exploited the kind of XML parsing vulnerabilities that you find in pretty much anything that uses XML. And even though it's pretty old, it still lives on. This is the Google search trends for SOAP web services. So it's been mostly supplanted by REST, which is a more modern API design. But there's still a lot of people looking for this. And it turns out all the big enterprise bits of gear, from WebSphere to Apache CSX, um, even Amazon was using it until a couple of years ago. And it's a lot of legacy support for SOAP messaging. There's a lot of old toolkits and a lot of old C and Java applications that are still using this. So what does the protocol actually do? Well, it's between an initiator and a responder. The initiator wants to send some request to the responder, and the responder is going to send back the response. And the initiator needs to be sure that the response they get matches the request they issued. So the initiator starts out knowing the public key of the responder, which is obviously pretty helpful. And the, but the responder is going to authenticate the initiator using some trusted third party or something otherwise outside of the protocol. So it's only a two message protocol. In the first message, the initiator is going to send over their public key in the form of a certificate. They're going to send a timestamp, T. They're going to take their request and wrap it in symmetric encryption. And then they're going to take that key for the symmetric encryption and encrypt it under the responder's public key. And then finally, they're going to sign the request in the timestamp such that the responder will know that came from the initiator. And the timestamp is there to stop some kind of replay attack. The responder is going to respond in almost the same fashion. They're going to take their response. And they're going to wrap it in, a, in symmetric encryption with a key. They're going to encrypt that key under the initiator's public key. And then they're going to sign the response. And interestingly, they're going to sign the initiator's signature. So rather than signing the initiator's request, they sign the initiator's signature. So we have the signature from the first message is signed by the responder in the second message. And they call this in the literature, in the academic literature, they call this signature confirmation. So this is where you sign a signature, and the idea is that you're going to somehow bind that response to the request. So we fed this into Tamarin to, to, see, uh, to do an automated analysis to see what would come out. And we find an attack. So the attacker is going to sit in between the initiator and the responder. The initiator is going to send out their first message as normal. And now the attacker is going to do a message key substitution attack. So they're going to look at the initiator's signature. They're going to pick a new request of the attacker's choice. And then they're going to create a new public key such that the initiator's signature is going to be valid for the attacker's message. And now they're going to transmit over a replaced message. So they're going to replace the initiator's public key with the attacker's public key. They're going to create a, then a new request, wrap it in their own key, and encrypt it for the responder. And then put forward on the same signature that the initiator so helpfully provided. The responder will not see anything wrong with this and will reply as it normally would. So it gives a response encrypted for the attacker's public key. So what the attacker can simply do is decrypt that response, re-encrypt it for the initiator's public key. It's public key encryption, so anybody can do this. And then forward on the same signature. So now the initiator has accepted the response, but the response the initiator is accepting is the response to the attacker. It's not the response to the initiator. So now the attacker could have arbitrarily chosen that request in order to confuse the initiator about the the truth of its original request. Because the initiator has made one request, the, the responder never saw that request. Instead, they saw a request of the attacker's choice, that, and the response to that request is eventually going back to the initiator. So this causes a confusion at a high level. This, so in general, this is because they've signed a signature. Because of all those subtle behaviors that we saw earlier, signatures do not uniquely identify the underlying message. So when you sign a signature, you're not signing the original message. You're just signing some opaque blob that the attacker is capable of manipulating. As well as this new attack on WS security, we found a number of other new attacks. 
So the WS security attack Tamarin finds in about 12 seconds. We found an attack on Scion. Scion is part of a, a next generation secure internet infrastructure and they need a scalable key exchange to be used in Scion. And it turns out they're vulnerable to exactly the same kind of uh, signature confusion attack. And then on Scuttlebutt, which is a current generation distributed web social peer-to-peer -peer network, and they have a secure handshake that they develop themselves, which they need for authentication between friends in their social network. And again, it turns out it's, it's using signatures, and it has the same kind of vulnerability to one of these attacks. So, takeaways. Signatures have some subtle behavior. This is subtle behavior that if you work, if you work on proving signature schemes, if you work on proving signature schemes secure, you don't need to care about because it's not part of the security definition. If you work on doing computational proofs of protocols, you don't need to care about it because your proof accounts for that behavior without you having to think about it. And if you work in the symbolic analysis, your tool until now has not captured this behavior. And if you're a protocol designer, I think you might be very surprised by some of this behavior because you don't know about it unless you've read exactly the right research papers from the early 2000s. I think it's quite underreported. Automated protocol analysis has continued to improve. We can capture a wider and wider class of attacks from before and find more and more attacks on real world protocols. And finally, it's kind of true in any, in any presentation that talks about a new attack. It's nearly always an old attack on a new protocol. This is not so dissimilar from the kind of stuff that we're we were talking about in the context of the PDF signatures and encryption on Tuesday. These are very much an old style of attacks applied in a new setting to stuff that is still being deployed and used in the real world. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. the talk. Um, I have two questions actually. The first one is, uh, I get how all these, uh, a signature scheme could be vulnerable to all of these and still be UFCMA. Uh, why was no other security notion proposed that implies the UFCMA and that covers also this? It's a, it's a really good question. I'm honestly not the right person to, to know. Uh, as far as I can tell, no people have proposed a security definition that would have got rid of, say, for example, key substitution. There was a paper published on it in 2005. I don't think it saw much follow-up. At the time, at least, people were, weren't interested. I don't know if that's changed now. I think we're all busy chasing the post-quantum bandwagon, so maybe we're still not interested. But, but it's the right time, because it's uh, standardized <laughs> now. And... That would be nice to see, yeah, but we'll, we'll see what happens, yeah. And uh, the second question is, uh, did you do um, responsible disclosure with the protocols? And what was the response? Yeah, so... Uh, for Scion and for Scuttlebutt, that was straightforward, and it was a real pleasure to work with the developers of both of those. For Oasis and WS Security, it's very difficult because it's an old protocol. If you think about most of these companies that are using it, the person that developed this stuff has moved on, you know, probably five years ago. But it, we sort of got there in the end, and things are still very much in motion to make sure we caught everything. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you.